Good morning, everyone. Take your Bibles, if you would, as we continue in our study of Luke chapter 12. And we are getting very close to the end of that chapter. We're going to tackle off a little portion this morning, chapter 12, verses 49 through 53, as we think of Jesus, the great divider. Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, the great divider. A blog entry from Northern Seminary relates three stories. One is of Annie. Annie's family was not thrilled that she had given her life to Christ. Then when she told them that she was being baptized, yes, in front of a church packed with hundreds of people, they told Annie, how can you do this? You are an embarrassment to the whole family. Betty's father was even harsher. When Betty told him that she was now a Christian and wanted to follow Jesus with her whole life, he said, from this moment on, you are no longer my daughter. Janice's mother listened while Janice explained what her life used to be like. The drinking, the drugs, the sex. But now she says, Jesus has changed my life. And that she was a new person living in a very different way. When she finished, Janice looked at her mom, hoping that she would be pleased and happy. But coldly and slowly, Janice's mother said, I wish you were like you used to be. All three of these women were devastated by their family's opposition and rejection of their Christian faith. But all three knew that above all else, their lives now belonged to Jesus. And whatever the price, they would follow him. In Luke 12, Jesus is given an invitation to follow him as the crowd listens on as Jesus gives instructions to his disciples. I'm beholden to John MacArthur, who summarizes this Jesus' teaching in this passage when he writes, Jesus says, you have turned from the, you need to turn from the dominating influence of the false teachers in your false religion. You've got to stay away from the liars and deceivers. To be a disciple of Christ, you need to stop fearing men and stop fearing the retribution that comes from men when you step out of your religious environments. And fear God who can destroy your soul and body in hell. You must also confess Jesus before men as your Lord and Savior. You must trust your life into the hands of the Holy Spirit because you will be facing persecution. You must reject the love of material things to be a true disciple of Christ. You must turn away from preoccupation with the world and you must pursue with all your heart the kingdom of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And you must do it with urgency, a constant readiness. For the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. You do not know how long you have. Jesus is pointing out that many of the obstacles that the disciples will face as they follow him. Discipleship calls for an uncompromising commitment and a constant readiness to follow to follow Christ by being faithful, being watchful in the face of these obstacles that will try to derail your faith, paralyze your Christian witness, and cause you to doubt. As we come to today's passage, Jesus surprises his disciples, along with the crowd that is listening in, with one more obstacle that will be very difficult to accept for many, including us here today. It's found in Luke chapter 12, verse 49. It's here in the monitor. Again, I want to encourage you to have your Bibles with you as well. If you need a Bible, please let me know. I'd love to give one to you so you can take one home today. In Luke chapter 12, verse 49, Jesus continues by teaching and saying, I came to cast fire on the earth and a wood that it was already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For from now on in one house, there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son, son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Father, these are striking words. Words that can be difficult (coughs) to understand and comprehend and to live out. 
I, Father, Father, I pray that you would just give us wisdom as we consider your words. Help us to learn. And above all, Lord, open our hearts that we may respond to the Spirit's work. Lord, that we may leave here differently than when we came in. Again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Luke and his faithful recording of what the Holy Spirit has revealed to him. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, Jesus' words here are startling at first glance. The picture painted here is not pleasant, nor one that many would want to, be, uh, want to entertain. Hostility and division among family members in our families. Now, many of you say, well, that's just a normal Thanksgiving or holiday weekend for us. We, we, we spend most of our times in hostility and, and, and dissension and division. However, Jesus is not speaking about typical arguments or disagreements or bickering that's common among family members and when we get together. Jesus gives an example of a household of five, a father, a mother, a son, a daughter, and then the mother-in-law that takes up sides against each other. However, it's not about the football game or which football team to go for. Again, most of us have experienced this type of situation where disagreements on politics, money, relationships, football, or even the television remote come into play. But the division promised here is more than just a family squabble or annoyance. This speaks of a disunity and dissension that creates a dire split between family members. One that is illustrated by the experience of the three ladies that we just read about just a few moments ago. And what is more striking, and get this, what is more striking is the basis for this division. What causes this division? As Jesus proclaims that he himself will be the great divider. He will be the one that will cause the division, the arguments, the dissension. He will be the one that creates the disunity. Jesus declares, going back to that passage, he says, I came to cast fire on the earth. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you rather, he says, Division, Jesus is the one who causes this. Now, this is a strange statement because usually when we think of Jesus, we think of Jesus as a man of peace. You know, he's the great uniter. He's the one that brings harmony. Is this not the one who we celebrate every Christmas, the Messiah? By by meditating on Isaiah, Isaiah 9, I believe it here on the monitor. Do we have that? Where he says, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of uh, David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness for this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of the host will do this. It means it will come to pass. But however, we see something different here. Take your Bible as you're still in Luke. Turn back to Luke chapter 4. And look with me at verse 17. In this passage at the beginning of his ministry, Luke writes that Jesus was asked to do the public reading of scripture while visiting a local synagogue. He says, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to Jesus. Jesus unrolled the scroll scroll, and he found the place where it was written, this Old Testament uh, scripture found in Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. We've looked at this quite a bit, this passage of scripture. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. If this does not say peace, then what is? What does it say? He rolled up the scroll and gave it back. And look what it says. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus encouraged his disciples in John chapter 16 when he said, I have said these things to you that in them you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Yet here he is declaring that he is here to cause division Among family. 
Look back at me with the, uh, back on Luke chapter 12 on the passage and observe some of the words he used. I, I cast out fire. Now, now, in this case, that word there presents a word image of a fisherman who is not fisher, fishing with just a fishing pole at some local area, but of casting out a net, a wide net in which they would take and they would unfurl it. And just bring in a, a host of fish at one time. This is not a surgical strike of casting fire, but he's, he's giving it as I'm going to pour it out. I'm going to cast it out around a wide area. The kindle, he wants to kindle, set a blaze. Peace means harmony, tranquility, safety, welfare, and health. But instead, he says, I've come to cause division, disunion, dis- uh, dissension. What is more startling is, is what or how Jesus will bring this division and and dissension. So Jesus is going to cause it, but what is it about Jesus that causes family members to to divide and to hate and to be angry? He says, we'll read once, once again with me at verse 50. In verse 50, he says, I came to cast fire on the earth and would that it was already kindled. He says, I have a baptism to be baptized with and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. What will cause this division? What is it about Jesus that will cause this division? It's his baptism. Now, he's not referring to his baptism with John the Baptist when he was baptized, immersed, by the way, into water. He was brought out of the water. But he's referring here to his death, his crucifixion in particular. Jesus is near the end of his earthly ministry. And the redemption plan that the Trinity set in motion before the foundation of the world is coming to a a fulcrum, to, to a culmination in which God is going to come to redeem and rescue the father's children from their sin and from his wrath. And it seems from his statement that Jesus is both desiring this event, this crucifixion. He's looking for it to come. He's desiring it to be kindled. But yet it also says he's dreading his appointment at the cross. He wishes that it was already kindled. But then he says, how great is my distress until it's accomplished. And of course, we now are reminded of the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed, if this cup, Father, can be removed from me, please let it be your will. Jesus was looking forward to the cross, but yet he was also dreading the suffering that he would undertake. The New American Commentary states, as you see here on the monitor, it says, Jesus' commitment to God's will was total. He was completely governed by the desire to complete his baptism, even though it meant suffering death in Jerusalem. He longed for his baptism despite what it entailed because only through its completion would the fire be kindled. Jesus' death is seen here not as a tragedy or a terrible twist of fate, but as the fulfillment of the divine plan of God. Jesus longed for his mission to be completed. But he also wanted his disciples to know how this would affect all those who would choose to follow him. It's coming at a high cost. Again, the cost of of discipleship is very high. That cost may include disunity and dissension within family members, between spouses and children. The image of fire in scripture is used for both judgment and purification. And so this fire will cause some to be judged, but it will also be a cause of purification. The crucifixion of Christ, get this, the crucifixion of Christ is the fulcrum of human history. Everything changes at that moment. No one can escape its message nor its implication. Everyone will have to give an account one day about how they have responded to the cross, whether they have heard of the story or not. Now, I want to spend some time answering the question of how does the cross 
cause this type of division? How does it divide families? How does it put people at odds against each other? What about the cross causes each other, even those who love and care for each other, to be angry, to even disown one another? Pastor John MacArthur, uh, concerning the Matthew's gospel account of this teaching, writes this. Though the ultimate end of the gospel is peace with God, the immediate result of the gospel is frequently conflict. That's conflict between all parties. Conversion in Christ can result in strained family relationship, persecution, and even martyrdom. Following Christ presupposes a willingness to endure such hardship. There is no sense in which we say, well, I'll accept Jesus as my Savior, but I'm not accepting him as my Lord. That's a, that's a false teaching. Following Christ presupposes a willingness to endure such hardship. Though he is called the Prince of Peace, as we've seen in Scripture, Christ will have no one deluded into thinking that he calls believers to a life devoid of all conflict. We need to understand this. What we learn from this passage is here looking for the big picture. It's here the purpose of Jesus' coming was to divide God's people from the unrepentant. He's choosing, if you like to use the words from our Sunday school, he's choosing the elect from the unelect. Those who he's chosen, those from whom he's passed over. Those who are Christ's sheep, those who are goats. The purpose of Christ's coming and his crucifixion was to divide God's people from the unrepentant. And as we do this, we are going to see it's going to create uh, just a, a, a division and a disunity as he does so. In Matthew 9, Jesus told the disciples, or the Pharisees, excuse me. He says, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. So that means, as you think of that, there's some he's come not to call. There are some he's called to ignore, to deny, to, to blind their minds. Going back to Simon's, or Simeon's, excuse me, a prophecy of Jesus' presentation at the temple in Luke chapter 2. You remember that when Jesus presented during those, uh, at his presentation at the temple, I believe he was, uh, was he, I think he's still a baby at this time. Simeon takes and he says, and he takes him, he says, blessed to them. And he said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rising of many uh, in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. A sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. You see, what the cross does is it reveals the hearts of people, of whether they're going to truly repent or those who will remain unrepented. Jesus' death will bring both peace and division. It will bring salvation, but it also brings judgment, depending on how one responds to Christ's redemptive work. Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and turn to John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, that passage, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. He's a Pharisee who is curious about Jesus, his ministry, and his message. And Jesus, as you know, many of you know, Jesus gives him a wonderful presentation of the gospel saying, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This causes some confusion on Nicodemus's part. So Jesus continued to explain what it means. But when we come to verse 18, Jesus finally has some words in closing to Nicodemus. In verse 18, he says, whoever believes in him is not condemned. Speaking of Jesus, they are not condemned. But whoever does not believe in Christ is condemned. Because he has not believed in the name of the Holy Son of God, only Son of God. And this is the judgment that light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Now you're seeing now what's happening here in the hearts of people. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come 
to the light, lest his works should be exposed. So now we're seeing why the division is coming. Because there's something about one who truly repents and their life has been changed that will cause that light to expose the wickedness of the heart of their spouse, of their children, their family, their brothers, so on and so forth. John MacArthur in his book, The Gospel According to Jesus, writes that Jesus came to expose us as sinners. You'll see it here. He says, the truth is that unless people realize they have a sin problem, they will not come to Christ for a solution. People do not come for healing unless they know they have disease. They do not come for life unless they are conscious that they are under the penalty of death. They do not come for salvation unless they are weary of the bondage of sin. You see, a disciple of Christ is called in Ephesians chapter 5 to take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. And as salt and light of this world through our, through our repentive hearts, through our coming to mean Christ's children, we are commissioned to call everyone, including our family members, including those we love, to repentance. And this is difficult. However, doing this is not going to make us popular with our family and friends, but yet we have to recognize that a failed gospel track is one that presents the gospel as an expectation of peace, guaranteeing a life of ease, peace, and tranquility. And let me tell you that any church and any pastor that preaches that type of message is a false church. Or they need to be taught the way more accurately. And so the cause of division, when Jesus casts that net, is the crucifixion, is those who will respond to it will respond in in repentance, but those who do not, the the light of the Christians is exposing their sin. They will not bear with it. We see this happening today in our culture, in our politics, in our businesses, and in our families as more and more governments and others are trying to close down any business that tries to live by a biblical standard, or anyone who wants to tweet out a biblical standard of, a, of, of, of pro-life or, 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 or um, same-sex attraction or traditional marriage. They just want to cut it all out. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, for we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved. In other words, we are a beautiful fragrance to many of those who are going to come Christ. They, they want to hear our message. They want to see our lifestyles. There's something about it that strikes their heart as the Holy Spirit works. But among those who are perishing, we're a fragrance of death to death. In other words, our Christian beliefs, our faith, our Christian tradition the way in which we believe that we are to order and conduct our life and walking in the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit themselves stink. They can't stand the fragrance, the odor, the aroma. And some of you have understood this and know this. Hey, you got saved, and it's not that you left your friends. It's just that one by one, your friends and family leave you. And want nothing to do with you. Now I pray that that's the case. If it's because you've been judgmental or arrogant. A proud or hateful Christian. As in Peter says, then you will be judged. Jesus understood this rejection. In the gospel of John, we learn that Jesus came to his own and his own people did not receive him. You see, Jesus was rejected before you and I were rejected. Jesus also declared for judgment, I came to this world that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind. Because you did not accept me, because you could not see, you have rejected me. One pastor notes that Jesus' declaration to his disciples and crowd that day were very strong and direct, but the die is cast for most. Israel, as we remember, Jesus is speaking to Israel at this point. He's speaking to them as a people and as a nation. I am your Messiah. Come and accept me. I am the the culmination of all your dreams and hopes. 
I am who the scripture has foretold and all of it is fulfilled in me. But as you and I read Luke and as we continue, you will see that Israel has no love for her Messiah. Israel has no desire for his kingdom. They want the kingdom on their terms. They have no interest for his salvation. They have no longing for his grace. They have no desire for the forgiveness he offers. The blindness of their minds through their own ignorance, satanic blindness, and the deception of their false leaders has manipulated them sufficiently into a state of rejection that they will unite in murdering their own Messiah. So Jesus understands this rejection fully, this division, for it's the very thing that will cause him to go to the cross, to be betrayed, to be tortured, to die. Unfortunately, this same heart attitude that's reflected in Israel's rejection of Christ is a reflection of the whole world. For it too has rejected Christ. It has rejected God the Father, as we see in Romans 1. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul writes that even if our gospel is veiled, if it's not able to be perceived by some to understand it, it is veiled by, to those who are perishing, he goes on to say, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. They cannot, they will not accept Christ. And this blind ignorance causes others to hate, to despise, to ridicule, reject those that accept Jesus' work on the cross. Some of you can give testimony to this fact. Even in this church, we have had some that have experienced the division of their family, relationship between their children and their spouses that have been harmed because of their faith and their desire to serve Christ. Maybe some of you have it yourself. Family, friends, neighbors, you're not invited out to the, to the neighborhood block party as much. People may wave, but they really don't want to get into an interaction with you. Maybe our coworkers. All due to our uncompromising commitment to follow Christ. It's not uncommon to find marriages where there is one is a disciple of Christ and the other is not. And it creates all sorts of issues. I remember young, one young man, I was young myself, a little bit older than Lando, probably about 10, 11. And we had a young man in our church. He was, he was a college age or so. Nice young man. Uh, he visited our church, became saved, got baptized, and started serving in different ministries. Eventually, God called him to go to seminary. And I still recall this at a young age because all of a sudden, I could sense something was going on. Still young, so you're, you don't always sense everything, but eventually you realize that's going on, and the pastor finally spoke about it, is that this young man wanted to go into seminary, but his family said, if you go to seminary, we will disown you. Could you imagine that? Disowning your own children? Because all they want to do is preach about Christ? I mean, what, what's so wrong about Christ? What is it about Jesus that makes so many people just, uh, just curl up and say no? You know, they, they like some of his teachings, He decided to go to seminary and was disowned by his family. He went off. I never heard more what happened. But I wonder, what choice would I have made? What decision would you make in that scenario? Easier to get along, go along? Well, God wouldn't want me to disobey my parents, so maybe it's just easier not to do what God has called me to do. God will forgive me. This is one of those things that you and I are called to. And in many cases, family can overcome some of those things, and, and, but many times they can't. Your family doesn't want much to do with you until they're in trouble, right? Then they all want counsel. This may happen more so with friends and coworkers and neighbors. 
You know, I know when I go golfing, many times I just don't tell people what I do. You know, they're all, you know, and golf has a way in which sometimes it brings out the inner man very quickly. You know, I remember one time I was doing it with one of my pastors and we were playing. We went through about eight, nine holes and this guy was just terrible. Finally, about the ninth hole, they said, well, what do you guys do? And at the time I wasn't a pastor, but uh, working at another, and my pastor said, well, I'm a pastor of a church. All of a sudden, boom. Brandon and I had the same experience. Remember the one, man, he's kind of going on with his kids and all of a sudden, we'll find out, oh, we came here from, we went to this church and that, oh, I know. All of a sudden, everything changed. Our first neighborhood outing where we live now, when someone asked what I did for a living, I said, I'm a CEO of a nonprofit organization that specializes in life change. Ooh, that sounds good. Then eventually my conscience gets me and I say, well, I'm a pastor. I haven't been invited back in a long time. These types of things happen. We know these things happen. And Jesus wants to be prepared because he understands that this is an obstacle that may be way too far for many. The cares of this world, the tribulations of the world, those weeds start to get way too much for many of us to overcome. So how are we to respond to this obstacle, this division, this unit, this this. This disunity. How can we prepare for this division? Faithful in our witness and faithful in, in watching for Satan's attempt to derail and destroy our relationships with others. To answer these questions, we'll once again consider the things to do, know, the things to do, and the things to be. First, you need to know that God has called you to be faithful even in the midst of this division. For it will come. And, I'll, and, I, and I may step on a line. This is Rob talking. This is not the Holy Spirit or Scripture. This is Rob's opinion. That if you are not receiving any of this pushback, then you may want to consider how much salt and light you're being. How much of an uncompromising commitment do you have? Or when you're with your friends and with your family, do you tone back the religious talk? The laughing at a joke that you shouldn't or watching something that you shouldn't do do, do you go into kind of like incognito mode when you're around other people that may be a thing but we need to know that God has called us to be faithful we are going to lose some relationships some we're going to experience some ridicule ridicule we're going to be canceled and accused of bigotry misogyny homophobic transphobic and even hateful all of these things will happen, and by the way, are happening to those of you who are aware what's going on in our society, our culture, and even in our politics. However, Jesus promised us in Matthew chapter 19, see this, you need to write this in your Bible if need be. Peter said to Christ, see, we have left everything and we have followed you. What then will we have? If, if I give all this up, this is a good question. If, if God has asked me to give all of this to follow Christ, then what will I have at the end? Jesus said, truly, I say to you in the new world, when the Son of Man was set on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also set on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Let me give you this. Whatever, whomever you may lose in this life because of your faithful witness in Christ cannot be compared to the glory and the reward that you will have in eternity, in the new kingdom, and new earth. It will be much greater. Now, I, I admit that that is easy teaching, easy preaching, but hard living. It is hard to consider that when our family members do not want much to do with us. When our friends or former friends don't want to hang with us as much. When the world seems to continually just crash down on us for our beliefs. But let me tell you, what is, he, what is here pales in comparison to what God has in store for his children. Secondly, the thing is to do. So the first was what to know. Here's what you need to do. You need to continually obey the word of God. 
We must embrace the cross of suffering. We must not uh, uh, try to avoid these dissensions and disunity that comes because of the cross. We should seek peace and harmony, even with those that are in the world. However, that's why he says, let your reasonableness be made known to all men, to be gentle. But gentle does not mean being weak. We need to embrace the cross of suffering. We need to continually obey God's word. We're to live out the commands that are found in James, as you see on the monitor. And he says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. This is including the division, the cancel, the ridicule, the maligning. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. You and I need to realize that even this division, this disunity, this disowning of family and friends and neighbors and coworkers is something that will shape us into the image of Christ who knew what it to suffer. Many times I've shared this before that Jesus was suffering and even rejected by his family before the cross. Thank God after the cross, his family found unity as his brother became the elder, the pastor of the Jerusalem church. He became the one that wrote the book of James. You never know what God may do because of your faithful witness. Many times scripture says, be faithful. He tells the woman who has an unsaved husband, it is by your demeanor and your submission that you will, that he may be saved. My mom is a great example of that. For 30 years, they came to, when they came together and got married, they both were not Christians. In 1971, someone knocked on the door. She accepted Christ. Her life was dramatically changed. And from that time, she prayed for my dad for over 30 years. It wasn't until 30 years he finally accepted Christ. And all that time, she was a loving wife to him. It doesn't mean that it was not difficult, but she was a great testimony of what Christ can do with a faithful Christian. Some of you may be in that, sense, in, that, in that essence with a spouse, a family member, maybe a friend. Continually pray for them, love them, continue to do the things. The best thing you can do for your friend is to live a faithful Christian testimony, salt and light. And then thirdly, be ambassador of Christ. That's what you've called to be. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, you see it here, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through us. We are the means by which others come to know Christ. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So we are to be ambassadors of Christ, not of our own agenda, not of our own dreams and hopes and aspirations, but the reason why God has given us family and given us friends and coworkers, neighbors, is so that we can then witness to them. Our call is, hey, my friend, I love you. Can you be reconciled to Christ? I have some bad news. You are now under God's wrath. But I want to share with you, I love you, and I want to share with you what Jesus has done. Would you too come and respond to the crucifixion, which is folly and foolishness to the world, right? But we need to share with them that is the true power of Christ. Ephesians chapter 6 Paul encourages the church to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all saints and also for me that the words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. You and I need to pray and have others pray for us that we may be able to boldly open up the word of God of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly so I ought to speak. We ourselves need to pray for that. Lord, give me the words to speak to my spouse, to my family member, to my children. Give me the words to speak to my friends, my co-neighbors. Instead of fighting about politics, instead of looking for ways to to find uh, burrs among each other, we need to speak words of gentleness and kindness. Driving our conversations towards the cross. I think it's Charles Spurgeon who said, doesn't matter where you start in the Bible. He says, start in any scripture, but in the end, wind up at the cross. If I may take a little bit of liberty, 
whatever conversation you may be having, whether it may be the new ride at Disney, whether it may be the new Coach's Oats, whether it's maybe landscaping, whether whatever it may be, start there and by the end of the day, get to the cross in some form or fashion. What would that do? What would that change? It will cause more, by the way, more division. However, it may cause some to come to Christ. And instead of losing a friend, you gain a brother and sister in Christ. Imagine it. Your family member, your friend coming in. Say, I've accepted Christ. And then we gather outside there and we're baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then we're here and we're singing together and enjoying the things of Christ. We're doing dinner together. We're doing communion together. We're going to heaven together. That should be your goal. That should be your desire. In all things, we are called to trust God's sovereignty and providence. Praying that he will bring our loved ones, our friends, and our neighbors to a saving knowledge of him. There is no guaranteed. We do not know God's chosen, God's elect. We don't know who God is going to call. But he has called us to love them and to share with them the words of Christ. In Philippians chapter 4, it's here on the monitor. I'd like to close with this. Paul, while in prison, says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, amen, <coughs> which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Peace is there, but also division. Let us commit, as I come to a close, to embracing the cross of Christ in every situation. I'm reminded of one of my early Sunday school teachers who taught that as Christians, we are called to bold obedience to God's word in defiance of circumstances and consequences. Even in the face of division, let us boldly obey God's word. May God grant us courage, grace, mercy, and love that we may glorify him in all that we do. Amen? Before I ask the worship team to come up and before we pray, I just want to give one word of encouragement for the events of the day. Obviously, as many of you know, war has broken out in Ukraine. We're not quite sure how far it will go. We're not sure if it's going to break out in the rest of Europe. We have no guarantees of these things. And in this world, I think it's, see, when we look at Putin, he's a madman. He's evil. Something has been ramped up in his mind and his soul and his spirit. I cannot tell any more than that. By the way, you know, Doug Landro, our missionary in Ukraine, continue to pray for him. At this point, he is safe. He is next to the border of Slovakia. So everything that's happening is pretty far from him as far as that country is. And it's, and it's a very large country, by the way. Uh, so at this point, he is safe, him and his family. Uh, the cafe that we helped uh, build and, and, and helped them uh, raise funds for, he's using that for a lot of refugees. There's a, it's a university town. Uh, and one of the things that the, the Nigerians, a lot of Nigerians there, they're complaining that they've been left, uh, they've been left by their country. Their country won't even help them get out. So they're trying to flee the country. And so they're, 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 they're helping them live in there while they're helping them find their way to either Slovakia, Romania, or Poland. So he's wanting to stay as long with his family to continue ministering as long as possible. Reading the news, I, I, wanna, I want you to be careful because right now, anything that's coming from Russia and Romania and anywhere else is so much propaganda. Many of the pictures, even of Zelensky, are not even real pictures. They're pictures from months ago. Uh, just be careful. One lady, they got a girl sitting there. She's got an airsoft gun, but now all of a sudden they're saying she's a Ukrainian you know, freedom fighter. So be very, very careful of what you're reading in the news. Uh, so I say all that, but Doug Landro has a Facebook page. Uh, if you like him, unfriend, make him one of your friends. And if you PM him, private message him, he'll put you on his private Ukrainian update where he's getting information from the pastors and his friends in Ukraine themselves. That news is actually much more informative than what I'm finding on everything else. So he, he's not discerning who gets it, whoever PMs him. He's given him, he had a couple this morning that were pretty, some good news, but also some bad news. So I'm saying all that to say, we're not sure where this is heading. 
there are many that are drum, beating the drum beats, right? We need to go to war. We need, we need to get more involved. And there's others who are saying no. And even that self is causing more division. This country has seen so much division. Family, friends, all of us. You know, we're fighting over everything. And as a Christian, like, what in the world is going on? How do I find any peace in this world? I don't want to watch the news. I don't want to turn on Twitter or Facebook. Because I, to be honest, I'm just losing faith. Where is God? Well, I want to bring you back to our scripture reading given earlier. And do I have that up there? The first part of it, I'm going to have you skip some of it, Ben. So first, as we see, once again, I'm not going to read it all because Landon did so. But he said, God is our refuge and strength of very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives away, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. The waters may roar, and foam though the mountains tremble at its swelling. We need to trust in God. And Rick gave us a good word in Sunday, before Sunday school. Was we need to trust in the sovereignty and providence of God. That this is all coming place in his preordained way. I don't, I don't think I have, I do have verses on there. Ben, can you go down to where verse 8 is on there? Or verse 7? Is that it? I can't see as well. Look at verse 7. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress, Selah. Here's where I want to press on. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shadows the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. One day war will have its final end. Amen? This day Jesus said that we will have wars and rumors of war. We desire peace so much, but however, we must not seek peace at any cost. Only the peace that God can bring. Look at verse 10. This is what he calls us. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of the host is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. One day these, this evil will stand before a holy God and give account. Until that day, let us trust in him. Amen. With every head bowed for a moment, every eye closed, worship team comes up, Randy, prepare for pastor's prayer. Again, I want us to take a moment to pause and to consider the words of Christ, his teaching to disciples to be prepared for division. <clears throat> to count the cost. And I'd ask you to lift up a prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to inform your mind and heart. Are you ready for that? Or maybe you're experiencing it today. How are you dealing with that? Is it one of embracing the cross or avoiding? I pray that you're embracing the cross no matter the cost. And would you pray that the Holy Spirit will give you strength and that you would respond to however he may be calling you this morning. Randy, would you come and close us in prayer? We hope you enjoyed this episode of Walking in Faith. We encourage you to share this with others. If you have any questions or comments, please visit us online or email us at info at orangevilla.org. Till next time, may God bless you in everything you do.